If you have your Bible, you can open to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I also have it here on this board. It'll be on the screen as well. And I'm excited to get into this today. In all the years that I have preached, for 13 years now, we've done the unusual. I have never referenced 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 in all the 13 years of preaching this series. And it is really a scripture of the unusual. Now, if you're wondering where does the unusual come from, it actually comes from the book of Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. Your Bible says, And the Lord wrought unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, insomuch that they took pieces of his garment and they sent them to those who were sick and suffering from evil spirits. And when they took those pieces of his garment and laid them on the sick, the sick were healed and evil spirits were driven out. It's an unusual thing to take a person's clothing and send it to somebody that's sick. But here's what I've learned. Sometimes it takes an unusual step of faith to get an unusual miracle. Because if you do what you've always done, you're only going to get what you've always had. And God doesn't move when we do what we've always done. God moves when we take a step and do the unusual. It's not a usual thing to step out on water and walk. It's not unusual. It's, it's not a normal thing to go and face a giant with just a bag of little rocks. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a usual thing to face, a, to face a city that's walls were so big chariots would race around the top. And you say, well, we're going to bring them down by just walking around them. Those aren't usual things. But when you do the unusual, you get the unusual. Now, if you think on December 4th we're trying to buy a miracle, you've missed the message. Because you can't buy a miracle from God. But you can initiate a miracle by taking a step of faith. And what I've learned is every time I've taken an unusual step towards God, God moves with an unusual miracle back towards my life. And we're going to sow a seed. We're going to sow a seed by faith. And we're going to reap an unusual miracle harvest. So now let's get into 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I'm not going to hold you very long, although it is a bye week for the Bengals, and I prophesied it last week that I not stand up here and say restoration was coming. I told you. I am a prophet. You know, the last time, it was, it was 2021, I went down there on the field, we interviewed one of the coaches who goes to church here, and I laid my hands on the field, and I said, I believe there's going to be a Super Bowl this year. We went to the Super Bowl. The organization has not invited me back to lay hands on the field again. I'm just saying. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Can you read it with me? Let's read it together. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Let's say it again, but let's change a few of the words. Ready? But you say, I am a chosen generation. Say it again. We are. Look at somebody and say, we are. A chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. My family, my household is a royal priesthood. I'm a part of a holy nation. It's not called America. It's not called Britain, United Kingdom. It's not called Russia. No, I'm a part of a holy nation, the kingdom of God. And my prayer is, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have a membership to a holy nation. I am a, I am a citizen of a holy nation. I have access to that nation's army. You have access to an angelic army. It's not the U.S. Army. It's not the Marines. It's not the Navy. It is the heavenly host. That's what you have access to because you're a citizen of that country. You have access to the benefits of that country. Healing, deliverance, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. These are just some of the things being a part of this nation. I am. Say it with me. I am. We are. God's special people. 
that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness. He called us out of something. He called us out of something. Called us out of something. Called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we're going to go through this. But the first word I really want to zero in on is this word right here. Because if you've read it in the King James, you know the King James doesn't use the word special. The King James uses the word peculiar. P-E-C-U-L-I-A-R. Is that right, teachers? Thank you. That's the men, men. There was one brother. He was confident. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. We need him editing our stuff. That was peculiar. What does peculiar mean? Strange. Just look at somebody, you know, like when a dog hears a sound, just look at him and go, you are peculiar. You are strange. You are uncommon. You, you look at him and say, you're not normal. You're unusual. When you see something peculiar, when you see something strange, when you see something unusual, it probably means it's standing out from something, not blending into something. No one has ever called vanilla peculiar because it blends into everything. God did not call you to be a person who blends into everything. God called you to be a person who people look at and say, you you don't fit in with the rest of us. Because you see, when the economy goes down and we're losing our mind, you seem to have access to something that we don't know about. You see, when something's going on in the world and we're afraid, you have a confidence and a boldness. that we, Are you watching a different news program? Do you have access to information that we don't have? Well, yes, I do have access to information that you don't have. As a matter of fact, I am very peculiar. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I've been called out of something. I'm a part of a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. So... Yeah, I don't, I don't fit in with this world around me. In fact, the Apostle Paul called me an alien. The Apostle Paul called me a stranger. The Apostle Paul said, no matter how hard I try, I can't fit in down here because this world is not my home. I'm going to a city whose builder and maker is God. My, the city that I'm going to doesn't have a sun for its light. It has an S-O-N for its light. And he is the light of that city. And the light goes on forever and forever and forever. Yeah, I don't fit in down here. I'm a peculiar person. In other words, you are not called to follow trends. You are called to set trends. Now, I get it. Some of us follow trends. There was a day that if you owned a pair of Crocs, you would be laughed to scorn. You would be mocked. You would be shamed. But then one day, Justin Bieber puts on a pair of Crocs. Next thing you know, I got a pair, Kim's got a pair, Sage's got a pair, Russia's got a pair, I go out with my shorts on, I got my socks pulled up almost to my knees, and I'm walking around in my Crocs, because I'm a believer, right? Not a believer, a believer. There are some trends we follow, I get it, but it should not be the world influencing the church. It should be the church that's standing out and saying, I'm sorry, we don't follow you. You need to follow us. Because you don't know where you're going. We know where we're going. You don't have any direction. We have a direction. And we know what we're supposed to you're, you're losing your minds down there because you don't know what you're supposed to do. We know who we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do because we got an author and the finisher of our faith and his name is Jesus Christ. There should be something different about you. Don't get mad when you don't get invited to parties. You're peculiar. What is God doing? You are a holy. Holy means set apart. Set apart. He picked you up and made you different. 
This is why even when you try to sin, it doesn't work. Because you have been set apart. There is something different about you. And let me take it even further. Are you ready? You are, say I am, a chosen. You've been chosen. You have been chosen. You know, I remember back in 1987, I found the Lord. Honey, you didn't know where to look. Jesus wasn't lost, you were. He found you. He came looking for you. Jesus said when there's, when there's a hundred sheep and one runs away, he doesn't say the sheep, the one that got away goes looking for the shepherd. He said the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes looking for the one. He found you. He came looking for you. He snatched you up out of the world. He snatched you up out of all the mess you were in. He chose you. Say that. He chose me. He chose you when your past was still your future. He chose you knowing everything you were going to do, and he chose you anyways. He knew about the drugs. He knew about the rape. He knew about the promiscuity. He knew about the sleeping around. He knew about the two divorces. He knew about the bankruptcy. He knew about the prison sentence. He knew about the losing your mind. He knew about the anxiety. He knew about the nervous breakdown. And even though all that was still in your future, one day God came and tapped you on the shoulder and said, I want you. I want you. You are chosen. You are chosen. You are chosen. Cho knowing everything you were going to do, he chose you anyways. He chose you. Look at somebody and say, he chose you. That's why you're not in a club right now. That's why you're not in a crack house right now. That's why you're not losing your mind right now. That's why you're not in bed right now. Why did you get up and come to church? Because you're chosen. There's something different about you. You can't explain it to the world, so don't try. You're chosen. Give Jesus a big praise. Come on. You are chosen. You are chosen. You are chosen. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. That's two things. That's a combination. Priesthood doesn't deal with royalty. Royalty doesn't deal with the priesthood. So he's calling us two things here. He's saying we're a royal priesthood. So we are kings and priests. We are kings and priests. You ever, you ever watch documentaries about the royal, royal family or the royalty? You ever see how they walk around and they just do things differently? They walk different. They talk different. They act different. They have different ways of doing things. Why are you acting like the world when you're royalty? Why are you living like the world when you're royalty? You're a, you're, you're a child of the king. Which makes you a prince and a princess. So anyways, we got a priest. Hood. Priest. He didn't say I made you a royal priest. He said a royal priest hood. This is different. Let me explain what this means. You have Abraham. You have Isaac. You have Jacob. Jacob gives birth to 12, or Jacob's, wife, or Jacob's wives give birth to a total of 12 sons. Jacob has 12 sons. One of these sons is named Levi. Levi will become a tribe called the tribe of Levites. The tribe of Levites will be selected to be the Levitical priesthood. The only way you can become a priest to serve in the tabernacle or the temple of God is you must be born of the tribe of Levi. Judah didn't get to serve as priest. The tribe of Reuben didn't get to serve as priest. The tribe of Benjamin didn't get to serve as priest. If you wanted to be a priest, you had to be born in the tribe of Levi or the Levitical priesthood. So what he says here is you have been made a part of a royal priesthood. So I became a priest 
by birth, just born into it. And then my kids and my kids' kids are going to be born into it just because they got born into the right family. Now, I know you may not have been born in the right family, but I got good news. You were chosen, and you've been born again. And when you were born again, you were born into a royal priesthood. Oh, but I'm going to talk about an unusual seed, but I'm not talking about your financial seed yet. No, I'm talking about a seed that has much more importance and much more value. That is the seed that comes from your life, your children and your children's children. Because what I need you to see is when God chose you, he didn't just choose you. He chose anyone connected to you because he intended to have a priesthood. My children are going to get access to something they wouldn't have had before because their parents got born again and brought into a royal family. In other words, if God chose me, he chose my seed. A priesthood is a generational legacy. i got to do some teaching first, then we're going to shout. Psalms 89, 1 and 2. This is for parents in the room. I feel this heavy for parents in the room, grandparents in the room. And, and let, me, let me just say real quick, if you don't have kids, and let's say you, you're at an age where you can't have kids now, anything that gives something life is a parent. Some of you are parents in the natural. Some of you are parents in the spiritual. When you give life to something, you are a parent to that thing. Let's go. Psalms 89, 1 and 2. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Now I want you to watch how many connections there are back to 1 Peter. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Now what does built mean? It means it's being added to Mercy is being added to, think of it like a bank account. And you are making deposits in this bank account that you're not going to draw from. Your children and your children's children are going to have access to this account. And it's an account that's full of mercy. Watch. Go to verse 30. Now, here's, here's what he's saying. Listen, he's, prophes- he's saying this to David. Listen what he says. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. In other words, God's, God's saying, I'll whoop them. Even if they're too old for you to whoop, they're not too old for me to whoop. I didn't say whip, I said whoop. There's a big difference. Whip whip is, now you bend over, I'm going to give you three. No, whoop is when your dad pulls that belt and it clicks like a machine gun on every loop. Click, 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 click. That's whoop. Whoop is hairbrushes. Yardsticks. Switches. I never asked for that paddle ball when I was a kid. See, I was, when you are raised by parents who whoop you, you are selective in your toy request. Because you pick the wrong toy, you're going to get hit with it. Yes, amen. God says, I'll whoop him. Hebrews goes on to explain what he means there. God chastises those he loves. So in other words, God said, I'm not going to let him get away with it. I'll deal with him. But watch verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. You hear what he's saying? He's saying your kids, they walk away, They get in sin, and God said, I may have to whoop them. 
but I won't forget them. Because you as their parent, you as their grandparent, have made investments into an account called mercy. And you have built up an account of mercy that when they get in trouble, there will be enough mercy to cover them in their trouble. When one generation is faithful, it is possible to build up mercy for the next generation. You don't even realize what I'm preaching right now. What I'm saying is the very fact that you are in church today, you are making deposits into an account that you're not going to withdraw from. You are going to make, you're making deposits in an account your children and your children's children are going to have access to one day when they're living in sin, when they're away from God. But one day mercy's going to grab them. Mercy's going to get a hold of them. Mercy's going to bring them back to the house of God because of your faithfulness. They'll have access to mercy. We can affect our children for generations to come. Here's the big idea. My life is either a stumbling block or a stepping stone to my children. Our children should get to heaven in part because of us, not in spite of us. There is an inheritance of faith there is an inheritance of godly living that can absolutely be passed down to your children and your children's children. This is a peculiar life. The peculiar life is a generational legacy. The peculiar life is a generational blessing. What I'm saying is what you're doing today is bigger than you. Some of you don't have grandkids yet. You don't know their names. You've never even met them. Your kids are still small. But what you're doing today is going to bless children that you never even met before. But you're already storing up blessings and mercy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. David is getting ready to die. David wanted to build God a house. God said, you got too much blood on your hand. You can't build my house. David said, well, then you need a house, God. We want to build you a house. He said, it'll be for your son Solomon. Now, David could have said, okay, then you'll provide for him. That's not what David did. David went to work, and he started raising funds to put in a treasury that when Solomon became king, he would have everything he needed to build the house of God. Solomon didn't have to beg people for money. It was already stored up. David gave personally $1.3 billion dollars. For the building of God's house. The people gave $1.7 billion. So they put that aside. $3 billion is in the treasury. And Solomon has not even sat on the throne. But it's already stored up. Waiting for him to get in place. You're doing something significant today. You're passing something down today. Here's what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 9. I want you to watch this and, and, and read it on the screen. Even Levi, now who's Levi? He is the Levitical priesthood. Levi, the tribe of Levites who become the priest or the priesthood. They become the tribe of the priesthood. So Levi, who receives tithes, what's he saying there? Malachi, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Who did you give your tithe and offering to? When you came into the storehouse, you would hand it to one of the priests. You would hand it to one of the Levites. You would hand it to somebody of the Levitical priesthood. They would take your offering and, and they would uh, do what was needed to be done with that offering. So you brought the tithe to the storehouse, handed it to Levi. So here's what he's saying. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. Abraham never met Levi. Abraham beget Isaac. Isaac beget Jacob. Jacob beget Levi. You following me? He's never even met Levi. But yet Levi paid tithes through a great grandfather he never met. Leave, because here's what happened. Abraham has an encounter with a priest by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, some theologians believe, is an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. 
So Abraham meets Melchizedek and he gives Melchizedek a tithe, 10% of everything that he owns. He gives it to Melchizedek. He tithes to the priest. Levi was still in the loins. Go on to the next verse, verse 10. He's still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. He's in the loins of Abraham. He's generations away. But yet when Abraham paid tithes, Levi paid tithes. The Bible teaches that when I tithe, there's a blessing of God on my life. When I give, there's a blessing of God on my life. Levi is not even born yet, but yet he's already under a blessing because of something a great-great-granddaddy did that he ain't ever met. See what's happening here? Abraham gives, and when Abraham gave, Levi gave. Abraham gives, Levi gave. Why? Because Levi was in the loins of Abraham. And out of Abraham would come Isaac, and out of Isaac would come Jacob, and out of Jacob would come Levi. And God said, but that's, here's the way this generational thing works. When you do it, I account it to your children and your children's children. You don't realize what's happening when you serve in the house of God. You don't realize what's happening when you give in the house of God. In a few weeks when you sow an unusual seed, you're going to be sitting waiting for a harvest. And you should be believing for a harvest. But honey, it's bigger than a season. It's bigger than one time. No, it's not just going to be a harvest for me. It's going to be a harvest that my children get access to. And my children's children are going to walk in the blessing of God. And they're going to say, where did this open door come from? Where did this opportunity come from how did this happen for me well I must jump I must I must be lucky no you ain't lucky you got a great great granddaddy and a great great grandmother who was faithful to God and faithful to God's house and that opened doors for you am I preaching anybody today watch my life sets the tone for my children if missing church is normal to me It'll be the standard for them. So if you just miss church for any sport, any activity, anything else going on, and that's normal, you've just set a path for your children and your children's children. Here's what Jeremiah 32, 18 said. I will repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. Here's what he's saying. Whatever is in the root gets in the fruit. Whatever's in the root gets in the fruit. I don't want my children to have to overcome what I didn't. If you are dealing with drug addiction, get victory over it. Don't make your children fight a giant you weren't willing to. Don't leave a giant for the next generation. Don't leave a giant of sexual impurity for the next generation. Don't leave a giant of pornography for the next generation. Don't leave a giant of alcoholism for the next generation. Don't leave a giant of fear for the next generation. Don't leave a giant of depression for... You get in the valley and you knock that giant down so your children never have to face him. Somebody give Jesus a big praise. Your kids will never forget what you are doing. Never. That's why we started Sunday night church. Because I wanted kids to come into the house and sit right next to their mama like we used to. And watch her mama dance in the aisle. And watch their mama praise God. And watch their daddy weep in the altar. And watch their daddy walk back and forth. I wanted your kids to see it. Because more is caught than taught and I wanted them to see there's power in this place there's joy in this place there's grace in this place and there's something special about this place give Jesus a big praise your kids are never going to forget what you are doing never going to forget God may be blessing you because somebody stored up mercy over your life you are here today because somebody else stored something up when I was a kid 
She used to make me so angry. I couldn't get away with anything. I would try to do something. Nobody else, nobody there knew who I was. And I would try to get away with something. But yet somebody somewhere knew my parents, saw what I was doing. And before I got home, my parents would be sitting there waiting on me. We know what you did. How do you know what I did? All the other kids got away with it. And I would get in trouble. You say, how? Because I had grandparents who had stored up mercy. And I had parents who had stored up mercy. And the mercy of God is not letting you get away with stuff. The mercy of God is going back to your parents and saying, let me tell you what they did tonight. When you get home, you get them. And when I walked in, I kept, even though I tried, even though I tried, even though I kept trying to get into sin, I got in trouble every single time. That's the mercy of God. That's the mercy of God. Because you can't be everywhere with your kids at every moment, but the mercy of God can. You can't be with your kids every second of every day, but the angels of the Lord are encamped around about those who fear the Lord. And even though they try to get in with the wrong crowd, there's going to be something grab them by the back of their collar and pour them right back out of that crowd. What is it? Your faithfulness to the house of God. Your love to praise and worship God. Your love of the word of God. I've got to hurry. Psalms 89, you're building it up. You're building up mercy. What's that mean? God is not going to treat my kids like everybody else's kids. And you ought to have an attitude that say, my kids have an advantage. Because we have a covenant. God's not going to treat my kids like all the world's kids. They don't have a covenant with their God. I got a covenant with my God. And it's not just for me, but it's for me, my children, and my children's children. Here's what the Bible says, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being a priest. And watch what he said. Watch what he says here. I will reject you from being a priest because you have forgotten the law or the word of God. I also will forget your children. So here's what he's saying. People who don't love this, you're not a part of the royal priesthood, and I'll forget your children. But when you love the Word of God, when you prize and prioritize this book right here, when you start your morning off with the words of this book, your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. It is, a, it is the bread. You devour this. You live on this. You eat this. And when you prize and prioritize the word of God, God says you're part of a royal priesthood. And look at the opposite. I will not forget your children. I will not forget your children. Somebody's love of the word is keeping your children alive today. You have children that should have died of a drug overdose, should have died in a car wreck, should have died with a gunshot, should have died in the streets, but they're alive today. Why? Because you love the word of the Lord. You love the house of God. You love the things of the Lord. That's the only thing keeping your children alive. You keep building up mercy. You keep building up mercy. Psalms 103, 17. But the mercy, shout mercy, mercy. of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to the children's children. Luke 150, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. See, I'm believing God today for unusual homes during this season. Peculiar homes. Homes that have a different spirit in them. That don't have the spirit of the world. No, they, they gotta, they gotta, there's something different in the atmosphere when you walk in this home. This house is unusual. And there's an unusual favor on this house. When I read about the plagues in Egypt that God sent through Egypt before Pharaoh let God's people go, there was one plague called a plague of darkness. And the Bible says Egypt was completely covered in darkness. Yet, where God's people were in Goshen, there was light. I don't have to walk two feet out 
out of the front door of this church to see that this world is getting covered in darkness. But let the darkness come. Let the gross, gross darkness cover the earth. I got a promise. Arise, shine, for your light has come. It may be dark in the world, but there's going to be light in our home. It may be sickness in the world, but there's going to be healing in our home. It might be financial problems in the world, but there's going to be blessing and provision in this house. We are peculiar. We are unusual. And we have the favor of God on our household. 2 Timothy 1.5. I promise you I'm going quick. 2 Timothy 1.5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, Paul's writing to Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Did you hear that? It was in them before it was in him. A genuine faith. He didn't earn this genuine faith. No, in some service, Grandmother Lois got saved. And then she brought her daughter, Mother Eunice. And Mother, and Mother Eunice got saved. And then Mother Eunice got so wrapped up in Jesus, she started taking young Timothy to children's church. And what was in Lois got in Eunice, and what was in Eunice got in Timothy. And Paul picked Timothy and said, when I leave, I'm passing this thing down to you. I didn't read, Paul didn't write anywhere about Grandfather Henry or, or, or Daddy Jacob. No, he talked about the grandmother and the mothers. And I want to say something to the single moms in the room. It doesn't matter who walked out on you. When you got a genuine faith on the inside of you, don't think because he walked out, he took the blessing with him. No, there's still something on the inside of you that God put there and you're going to pass down to your children and your children's children, regardless of who left you, who betrayed you, who cheated on you, who abandoned you, who walked out on you. Solomon he wants to build this temple. You know, Solomon's not just unique because of what he did, but because of what his daddy did. David has now been dead 11 years. Say 11 years. Solomon has built that temple with the reserves that David had let up, have, has, has built up. Solomon offers a tremendous offering. Just one part of the offering, 20,000 oxen were slaughtered on this day. And Solomon goes into the temple and he prays this Beautiful prayer, glorious prayer. Nothing happened. There was no move. There was no change in the atmosphere. But then he gets to this last sentence. Second Chronicles 642. O Lord God, do not turn your face from your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. And when Solomon said that, the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests fell on their face and they weren't even able to stand up to minister under the weight of the glory. And the doors of the temple were flung open and the glory of God spilled out into the outer court. Not when Solomon prayed, but when he mentioned David. That was God's heart to Solomon's daddy. And when he said David, the glory filled the house. David's now been dead 23 years. Somebody say 23 years. Solomon's messing up. He's getting into all these wives and concubines. What is it, 700 wives, 300 concubines, 1,000 women? Brother. Somebody, somebody said, I thought he was the wisest man who ever lived. Why did he marry so many women? Well, I guess he just figured when he got off of work, one of them would be in, good, be in a good mood. I read that somewhere. I, I didn't come up with that. First Kings, Solomon's in trouble now. He's not living right. And the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, David's been dead 23 years, because you have done this, you have not kept my covenant and statutes which I have commanded you. I will surely tear away the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Verse 12, nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. You think something you're doing is the reason you're blessed? Nope. Somebody sowed seeds that you're now walking in the field reaping. 
And the reason some of you aren't dead, the reason some of you aren't in jail is because somebody built up mercy for your life. David's now been dead 57 years. Say 57 years. One of his great grandsons, Jeroboam, is now on the throne. He is a wicked king. He is a wicked man. And God comes to deal with Jeroboam. And here's what he says, 1 Kings 15, 4. Nevertheless, I'd wipe you out. I would take your life today. But nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. God said, I'd wipe you out. I'd bring darkness on the land. But for the sake of David, I'm going to leave a light burning in Jerusalem. David's now been dead 305 years. Say 305 years. He's been dead a while. Hezekiah, his great, 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 great grandson, is now on the throne. An army surrounds the city. And they're going to wipe them out. Their numbers is like the, the number of men on the uh, number of sand on the shore. There is no way Hezekiah can win this battle. And the king of the Assyrian army sends Hezekiah a letter saying, we're going to wipe you out. Hezekiah takes that letter and do you know where he runs? The same place as great, 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 great granddaddy used to run. He runs to the altar of the Lord and he lays the letter before the altar and he steps up and goes, God, what are you going to do about this? And God responds and here's what he says, 2 Kings 19, 34. I will defend this city and I will save it for my own sake and for my servant David's say this ain't got nothing to do with you hezekiah this ain't got nothing to do with your granddaddy or your great granddaddy but all the way back in a shepherd field i made a covenant i made a covenant with somebody who had a heart like mine i made a covenant who wanted me more than they wanted food their heart beat for me like a deer pants after the water and he had he had my heart so i struck a covenant with him and now 305 years after his death i still remember the mercies that your great 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 dan granddaddy built up for you and i'm going to dispatch one angel and god let loose one angel and wiped out 187,000 assyrians in one night what am I saying there's going to be a day your grandchildren are going to be surrounded by the enemy sickness is going to surround them problems is going to surround them and there's going to be something in their mind that says what did my grandma do in times like this what did my granddad do in times like this and they're going to run to the church and when they do God's going to dispatch an angel and he's going to wipe out all their enemies but not because of them but because of your faithfulness and because of your faithfulness and because of your faithfulness give God a big praise in the house all right I gotta wrap this up hey, it's my first time back in a month give me a break Exodus 25 I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me I will visit iniquity the children had nothing to do with it but what's in the root gets in the fruit. This is why when you see an alcoholic father, it's not unusual for a son to grow up and be an alcoholic and for a grandson to grow up. And that's why you see things called generational curses. No, it's generational iniquity. It's generational sins that have never been defeated and dealt with. Third and fourth generation. Deuteronomy 7, 9, listen what God says. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Iniquity, third and fourth generation. But somebody who steps up and says, Lord, I love your word. I love your house. I'm sold out. I'm devoted to you, holy God. Everything I have is yours. I'm obedient to your word. I'm obedient to your voice. God said, I'm not just going to visit blessings on the third and fourth generations. No, there's going to be a blessing released on them for a thousand generations. This is bigger than you think. When my dad came to Cincinnati, Ohio, 1967, 15th and race, they would walk up and down them streets inviting people to church 
doing their best to fill that church. My dad walked so many streets that he wore holes in the bottom of his shoes. Evangelizing. Trying to bring people into the church. They, they operated an outreach, a clothing pantry in the bottom of that church. And they gave clothes to everybody in the city around them. One day God called my dad to build a, a different building a little further up the highway in Bond Hill. And to build that little brick building church that only held about 300 people. My mom and the ladies of the church would work hours on end making candy and they would take that candy and sell that candy and take the money and use it to, to buy the material to build that church. My dad didn't have enough money to even hire a general contractor. He had to contract the whole thing himself. Almost lost his mind while he was building that brick building. Up on the rafters of that church nailing the pieces of wood into place. My dad if you walked in that church on a Sunday night around 4 o'clock up on the left side of the stage, there was a little office. There was a little door, a particle board door, because they couldn't, afi couldn't afford to buy solid wood doors. They had to put in these little particle board, particle, uh, board doors you could almost poke your finger through. But what it did is it let the sound come out of that back room. And if you would walk in about 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, you would hear my dad back in that little office praying. And his voice would echo all over that tiny sanctuary. My dad never dreamed that while he was back in that little office behind that little door in that little brick church while he was praying, he wasn't just praying for God to fill a little brick building on Town Street. No, my dad was calling a building in Lebanon, Ohio, and my dad was building a church in Forest Park. And it wouldn't be up to him to step into this place. No, he was laying an investment. He was laying an inheritance. He was building up mercy that he didn't know one day his son would be walking in the blessings that he had, had stored up for him through faithfulness, through sacrifice, through dedication to the house of God and the call of God on his life. You think I did this? I'm not smart enough, church. I am walking, I'm in homes I didn't build. I'm reaping from vineyards I didn't plant. I'm drinking from wells I never dug. The blessing of the Lord was passed down from my grandparents to my parents and now my children and my children's children are gonna walk in the blessing and the favor of God because that's how this thing works. You say, but pastor, I didn't have parents that prayed. I didn't have parents that lived for God. I don't even know who my dad is. What am I supposed to do? Nobody built up mercy for me. Well, there's something called a transitional character. And here's what it means. It's a person who in a single generation changes the entire course of a lineage. In a single generation says, I don't know what y'all did up to this point, but it changes with me. You may have not, you may never have got victory over the giants, but that ends with me. Giants go down in my life. My kids are not going to put up with the mess that you left for me. So I'm going to go ahead and deal with it now. And I'm going to start building up mercy. And I'm going to start building. They're going to have open doors of opportunity. And they're going to say, how did this happen? Because you had a mama that stood up and said, I'm going to be a transitional character. I don't have to let. I'm a part. I'm a, I've been chosen. I've been born again. I'm a part of a new family, a royal priesthood. Stand to your feet if you will. If you receive this message, Give Jesus a big praise. <laughs> Pastor, I've got a son, I've got a daughter, and they're lost today. They're lost. They don't know the Lord. Yeah, but guess what? If they were raised in this house, the prodigal knows the way back home. 
Your kid has an advantage that the rest of the world doesn't have. They've already been in the Father's house. So if they get away from the Father's house, they know how to get back home to the Father's house. They have a memory of how good it used to be. They have a memory of where they came from. And they're not going to live the rest of their life in this hog pen. No, there's going to be something that draws them back. It's mercy that you build up. Mercy and the goodness and the favor and the blessing of God that you have built up for their life. You have a promise. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they get old, they will not depart from it. I got a promise. Lift your hands right now and say, thank you, Lord. We are going to be a peculiar household. We're going to be an unusual household. And now if you have children, if you have grandchildren, if you have spiritual children, I want you to start calling their names out right now and start saying, Lord, I lay up mercy right now for my children. I lay up mercy right now for Sage. I'm laying up mercy right now for Rush. I'm laying up mercy right now for, for a son-in-law that I don't know yet and for a daughter-in-law I've never met yet. Lord, I'm laying up mercies right now for grandchildren. I don't even know what they look like, Lord. But right now what I'm doing because I'm in your house, I'm building up mercy. I'm building up mercy. I'm building up mercy. And even if my children try to leave, even if my children try to get out of, out of your house, even if my children try to go out in the world, there's going to be too much mercy on their life that they're going to be, they're going to come right back to the Father's house. They're not going to get away because we are a royal priesthood. This will not die with my generation. It'll be passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation and your children and their children you have lost children if you have somebody if you have a son and daughter that's not saved right now a grandson granddaughter that's not saved right now lift your hands wherever you are and start calling them out by name start calling them out by name and say lord as for me and my household we will be saved we are a royal priesthood Devil, you're not going to get my grandchildren. You're not going to get my children. I don't know where they are. The Holy Ghost, you know where they are. And I ask you to go right now and bring them home. Bring them home. Bring them back to the Father's house. I've built up too much mercy for them to die in sin. I've built up too much mercy for them to live lost the rest of their life. They will be saved. God, you keep your covenant. God, you keep your word. And God, you made a promise to me. My household will be saved. My household Household will be saved. Your children and their children and their children. Thank you, May Jesus. His favor be, be upon you. And a thousand generations in your family, and your children and their children and their children. Just for a moment, I want you to lift your hands and start blessing your house. Start blessing your children. Start blessing your grandchildren. Bless them. Bless them right now. Bless them right now. I feel there's a, there's a generational blessing in this atmosphere. There's a household blessing. This is the unusual. This is the unusual. This is not just a season for you to reap. It's a season for your children and your children's children to reap where they have not sown. Be upon you and a thousand generations in your family. Your children, and oh. their children, and their children, may His favor be, be upon me. And a thousand generations in your family, and their children, and Now there could be somebody in this room, somebody watching online, and you don't know Jesus. You could become a transitional character today. You could change the entire lineage of your family. The history of your family could change today by one decision for Jesus Christ. God chose you. That's why you're here. Now give your heart to Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you just to pray this prayer with me. Are you ready? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Erase my past. Jesus, I believe. You died for me. You were buried for me. But you arose for me. Because you live, I will live also 
but not just me, but not just my, me. Children my children and my children's and children, children will, live children. will live in the blessing and the favor of God all the days of their life. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you made Jesus the Lord of your life, on the count of three, raise your hand up high. Do it quickly. One, two, three. Raise it up high. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness.